nothing that he can't do. He's able and he's willing. Hallelujah. Our God loves us that 
just that much. And I put my trust in him because I know that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all. A miracle can happen now. We have your Bibles. Let's confess together. Bible. I am what it says I am. This book calls me an overcomer. And that's who I am. Today I will be taught the infallible. So my mind is alert. My heart is receptive as I gladly receive the word today. I believe that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Happy Father's Day and happy Juneteenth. Amen. Hallelujah. The title of our message today is The Deal is Still On. The Deal is Still On. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God for your presence here today. We thank you that the atmosphere has been made for miracles. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would preach through us, hallelujah, and have your way, that we will move in the direction that you go. We declare today we will follow you, hallelujah, and we bless you for your spoken word. In Jesus' name, amen. deal is still on. Have you ever wondered if something in your past got in the way of what God wants to do in your future? I can say for sure this has happened to all of us. All of us has had something in our way. But the Bible assures us that God says the deal or the covenant that he made with us is still on. The agreement he made or promised is still in force. And God says to us, I know the plan that I have for you to give you a future. At the end of this lesson, we're going to look at Abraham as a great example of how God made a deal with him, and it did come to pass. But first, we'll receive instruction, some hard instruction, and then we'll receive much encouragement to know that the deal is still on. So stick with me. You might say ouch a few times along the way, as I have, but we're going to get to some encouraging words. Many times in our lives, we could say, I should have seen this coming. The result was actually predictable. But a lot of times, we just look the other way. Let me say that most personal problems cannot be fixed. When you fix a car correctly, it's as if it's new, almost as if whatever was broken never happen. We can fix a computer. We can fix a sink. We can fix the Wi-Fi as we had to do today. Most mechanical things, but humans are more com complex than that. We can learn from our past and we can move on, which is good, but you can't fix it. There are things in my personal life I wish I could fix, but I can't. And so I move on in the right direction. And that's good news. There are principles in the earth that operate the same way every time. And principles pertain to everybody. For example, gravity. It works the same way every time for everything and everybody. You can defy gravity, but it's only temporarily. So a principle is not a rule that you follow. A principle follows you. 
even if you're not aware. If it's not, some, it's not something you can choose to apply, it applies itself to you. Gravity applies itself to you. Seed time and harvest, sowing and reaping is a principle and it's applied to you. You cannot break a principle and if you ignore certain principles, they're gonna break you. You can leverage a principle to your benefit or you can ignore a principle to your demise. When you're lost driving, you don't pull over and ask for a solution. You ask for direction. And when we're lost, we need to know where we are and how to get where we need to be. There is no instant fix for being lost. We get to where we should be the same way we got to where we shouldn't be. In marriage, financially, relationally, professionally, with parents, with kids, academically, we get there not through solution, but through direction. People will go to a pastor or a counselor or a psychiatrist to get an issue fixed and they say, here's what's going on with me, I need a solution. But a wise counselor will tell you there is no fix. They know that the direction needs to change. You can be living in the wrong direction and be happier than you've ever been before, temporarily. You can be going in the wrong direction and it takes you where you don't really want to be and you have no idea where you're headed. When you're driving and you get lost, you're not exactly sure at what point you became lost. So it's possible you might not know you're living in the wrong direction because it hasn't hit you that you're lost. So you keep driving and then you figure out eventually, I'm lost. And it's time to change direction. The good news is, change direction and things will change. Let's go to Matthew 7, verses 24 through 29. Y'all like my intro? Let's see what the scripture says. Matthew 7, 24 through 29. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, so there's a hearing and there's a doing, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, so there's a hearing and a not doing, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat on that house, same storm, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In other words, what Jesus taught was to help them. Teaching with authority helps people. Authority is to help. It's not to abuse. It's not to misuse. Authority is to help. And the scribes, on the other hand, they just quoted a bunch of uh, laws that nobody could keep anyway. Jesus came to help and he says, you can predict which house is going to stand in the storm based on its foundation. Building a house is a process over time. Building on a rock is the hard, expensive, 
time-consuming way. Foolish things about now, but not later, and they take shortcuts. When my computer or my phone device acts up, the first thing I do is unplug it or turn it off, count to 10, <laughs> like we did today, and reboot. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times that works. But humans don't work like that. We can't unplug ourselves from the situation, try as we might, and count to 10. We're made in the image of God, living beings, full of life, not mechanics. So when you count to 10 and you open up your eyes, the problem is still there. Amen. The house built on the rock stood firm, not because the owner was lucky. You hear people say, they always seem to get by. They always weather the storm. Things always work out for them, but not for me. Could it be the foundation that's making the difference? The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. Everybody goes through storms. You can look at the most famous, the most rich, the most wealthy, the most popular people, and they are going through a storm. Everybody goes through them. You are not unique, but you need a foundation. And for those of us that are Christians, we have a place of refuge and strength to weather that storm. Getting lost driving is fully recoverable. You might lose minutes. You might lose hours on a highway, but life, not so much. So Jesus teaches us that we have to build our lives on something that lasts. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. And then he goes on to say, and we say it all the time, I will give men for you and people for your life. He will put people in your path. He will put people in your circle. He will put people in your oikos that can show you the right direction. Because God promised, I will give men for you. I'll give people for your life. Direction. If you don't get nothing else, I hope you get a lot out of this, but, but you really need to get this point. Direction determines destination. Direction determines destination. The best way to predict your future is to pay attention to where you're headed. Morally, financially, relationally, spiritually, academically. That's why God invites us to follow. When he chose his disciples, he said, follow me, because it's about direction. If Jesus is leading, you're going in the right direction. That's why he didn't tell them nothing else to do but just follow me. And I'll show you the path of life. You can say all day, well, I intended to do, but in what direction are you going? Direction always trumps intention. No one intends to get lost. We're lost before we know we're lost. Amen. If we could pinpoint just where we got lost, then we could back up to that point and get unlost. Yes. But we wind up where the road we're on ends up. We wind up on the road we're on ends up. So when you end up there, just look back at the road. I know this is hard, but I warned you. But we all have to look at the road we travel. None of us are exempt. Let's go to John 6, verse 47 through 48, and then we're going to skip to 55. John 6, verse 47 through 48, and we're going to skip to verse 45. Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. 
I am the bread of life. And verse 55 says, For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. This is what we do when we do the Lord's Supper. We partake of Jesus and the sacrifice on the cross. He says in verse 57, As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he feeds on me, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Therefore, many of his disciples, many, when they heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? If you think that's hard, where do you see me leave? Does this offend you? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him from the beginning. And he said, therefore I say to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Why? Because they were offended. Many people walk away because they're offended. Many people walk out of your life because they're offended. Many people walk out of the ministry because they are offended. They walked away from Jesus because they were offended. He said, are you offended? I'm trying to help you. I teach with authority. My authority is here to help. Are you offended? And then Jesus said, verse 67, Jesus said to the twelve, with his heart on his sleeve, do you also want to go away? Yeah. Sometimes your heart is on your sleeve yeah. when you're talking to people and you say, okay, did I offend you too? Do you want to go away like the rest of them? That's your right. But I'm here to help you. But Simon Peter answered him so correctly, so correctly. Lord, to whom shall we go? You, you alone, you alone have the words of eternal life. You alone. Where are we going? Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The ones that refused to let the life-giving word of God were offended. Where else can you go? Our worst decisions, I'm saying our worst decisions, were fueled by something with strong emotional appeal, including offense? Or is it something you bought, or you ate, or you dated, or you liked, or you followed? If a topic comes up and you become unusually defensive, pay attention to what's going on inside of you. Let's talk about appetites. This is still in the, in the hard section. Appetites can take us in the wrong direction. We are not to be ruled by appetites because appetites can pose a threat to our integrity. Proverbs 11 and 3. Proverbs 11 and 3 says, 
the integrity of the upright will guide them, but the pers pers perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them. Every day of your life, you have to say no to either your integrity or your appetite to protect the one and sat or satisfy the other. An appetite is a much longer list than just food and sex, yes. but those are the two most prevalent. But there's also fame, acceptance, recognition, achievement, material things, stuff, to be envied by others. Some are very reasonable, but they can still pose a threat to our integrity, especially if we're compromised. We don't lie, cheat, hide because it's right, but because it's a means to an end, and it satisfies or temporarily quenches an appetite. Let's review the short version of the story of Esau and Jacob, the twin brothers of Isaac. It's in Genesis 25, verse 29 through 34. It talks about Jacob was cooking some stew and Esau, his, his older brother, who was due the birthright inheritance, came in from hunting and he was famished. Verse 29. Now Jacob, the younger brother, cooked the stew and Esau, the older brother, came in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob, who took advantage of his older brother, like siblings sometimes do, and he wanted to leverage this hunger for his benefit. And so Jacob got a quick scheme in his head, and he said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I am about to die. So what is this birthright to me? And then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils and he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Notice it doesn't say he gave his birthright away. It says he sold it because there's a price involved. We say, well, he gave it away or she gave it away. No, they're selling it because there's a price. The reason it says Esau despised his birthright is because of how he devalued it. He said it's of no good to me right now. The birthright to the firstborn would have given him a double portion of the inheritance from his father and the authority as the leader of the family. But he told Jacob, I will give you my future claim to a valuable and coveted inheritance for one meal right now. Not even a weekly meal. Come back and cook me one next Sunday. Yeah, yeah, one meal. Come back next month and cook me another meal. He gave it up for one meal. Something as valuable as that. Who would trade their future, their integrity, their influence, their relationship with their spouse, with their kids, their reputation, financial security, academic security, potential ministry for something that would give a very short and temporary fulfillment? Nobody would agree with this when we're talking about somebody else. But when it's sitting right there in front of you, are you willing to make the trade? And in some season of our lives, we have all done this. And Esau built a case to justify his desperation. He walked in. He didn't crawl. He wasn't dying. He didn't say he was perspiring. He walked in. And he didn't even counter offer. 
Y'all at least try to count her off. If, if you're not going to say no, I know this probably isn't good advice, I know. <laughs> At least say you thought about it. <laughs> so as soon as Esau took the last spoonful of stew to his lips, he could predict his future. It's predictable based on the foundation. He was right in that he wouldn't get the birthright until the father died, but that day was going to come. And his appetite took that birthright away from him for a split second decision. Sometimes it's planned, I know, step by step, but a lot of times it's a split second decision. And so we might say, well, I would have lost my job if I had said no, or he, he would have left me if I didn't give in. We hear that a lot. I would have never been invited back. We justify why we do certain things, even though we know what's at stake. And what happened between Esau and Jacob didn't just affect Esau, but it ripped their families apart for generations. If you cannot be yourself because you're lying to yourself, then you can't give yourself entirely to someone else because you're not yourself. Amen. Amen. Let me say that again. If you cannot be yourself because you're lying to yourself, then you can't give yourself entirely to someone else because you're not yourself. When the season is over, when we fed those appetites, what do we have to show for it? It's all forgivable. Don't get me wrong, it's all forgivable. Because God is gracious. But you ate the stew. And when you trade what you traded, you can't get back. You can't undisappoint. You can't unhurt people. You can't change the GPA. As my goddaughter, the teacher, says to her students when they're surprised at their grades. Where do you think the zeros go? They're compiled into the GPA. So the potential is postponed. It's not canceled. It's just postponed. I'm going to give you an example of my son. In the ninth grade, at the end of the semester, they always gave an award ceremony. And you got an award if you were had the top grades. Well, his name never got called. And so he told his dad and I, as he was sitting right there, he said, next year, that's going to be me. So for the 10th grade and the 11th grade and the 12th grade, that was him. It wasn't canceled, but it was postponed. But it took three long, painstaking years to get to the top of his class because of what he refused to do in the ninth grade. Where do you think the zeros go? And that goes for life as well. It's all compiled in there. So right now, what is your bowl of stew, good or bad? Who or what is it difficult to say no to that you honestly need to say no to. We don't know what hangs in the balance when we make that trade. We, we, we think we do. But we definitely, definitely need something outside of ourselves to determine what's good or bad, right or wrong. And that's where the Bible comes into play. Paul says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Hitler believed that the cruel death that he orchestrated in Germany was a good idea. What, what one man can do. What the influence of what one man can do. One man. I ain't going to call no names, but the influence of what one man can do and influence a nation at least half of them. 
Let's go back to Abraham. Let's go back to Abraham so I can build you up and encourage you. It's not all bad. It's good, too. But the Bible says the word is good for reproof, rebuke, for doctrine, for instruction. It's good for all that. So God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you a deal. And he's saying the deal is still on. So in Genesis, he promised him that he would make him a great nation, even though Abraham didn't have any children. How do you have a nation of people when you don't even have kids? So later, Abraham messed up. And he tried to offer Eleazar, his servant, as the rightful heir. But God said, the deal I made with you, which is a covenant, is still on. And because his wife Sarah was barren, Abraham messed up again. And he had a child with the maidservant. But God said, that child is not the one. The deal with Sarah is still on. When they went to Gerar, Abraham almost lost his wife because he messed up and lied to the king and said Sarah was his sister. But God intervened because the deal is still on. And when Sarah was taken from Abraham and given to Abimelech, God shut up all the wounds in Abimelech's house so that not only Sarah wasn't getting pregnant, nobody else. Because the deal is still on. It's in the scripture. It said he closed up all the wounds. Just in case. So years later, you know, Abraham just kept messing up. But years later, when God blessed Sarah and Abraham and Sarah, with their promised seed, Isaac, God told Abraham, let me say this. When God gives you a promise, when it comes through, he's going to require something. And we say, you know, on, uh, when we're sick or on our deathbed or when we're in trouble, when our back's against the wall, Lord, if you get me out of this, I would do whatever you tell me to do. I'll serve you the rest of my life. And then when the promise comes through, Nothing. Nothing. Because you forgot the deal that you made. But God doesn't forget the deal. And so God told Abraham, he said, the promise is required right now. So you take your only son Isaac, whom you love, and you offer him as a burnt offering. I want you to kill him. Why? Because God wanted Abraham to agree and affirm and declare and prove that he believed the deal is still on. Abraham didn't bargain with God. He didn't counter offer like he did for Lot. He didn't pray about it. When is it okay to pray about a command? That's that nugget he was talking about. <laughs> if God gives you a command, what are you praying about? And you're praying to the commander. God says, can you do this? Well, I got, I got to pray about it. Well, who? 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 Who are you praying to? God says, I want you to serve me. Oh, I got to pray about it. God says, I want you to give this. Oh, I got to pray about it. Pray it's about the who. who? Right. That thing dropped like a, a, a ton of bricks. Thank you, Lord, for your revelation. And Abraham just did as God commanded. And not until Isaac was tied down. And the knife was in Abraham's outstretched hand and on its way to Isaac's throat did God intervene and say, 
now I know that you know the deal I promised is still on. It doesn't matter that you've messed up. We all have. But God has not given up on you. God says that it's not over. Because I made a deal. I made a covenant. I made an agreement with you. And it's still on. I just need to know. Do you know that? Even though we substituted God's plan for our own plan, the deal is still on. Even though we took a wrong direction, the deal is still on. God can show us new mercies every morning. He can give us chance after chance, but at some point we have to prove like Abraham that we're good with the plan that God is doing in us. We have to declare by action, not intention. God, I want that deal. It's still on. It's not over. Let God say over your life, now I know that you will not withhold from me what it is you think you love. I need to know that. That's part of the deal. And it's an easy deal. It's easy because we cast our cares on him. And he cares for us. We make it hard. But God says it's an easy deal. Come to me, all ye that are labored and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. It's an easy deal. When Abraham and Isaac were on their way to make the sacrifice, Isaac said, Dad, there's something missing. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, Son, the Lord will provide. But we got to show up. It's a three-day long journey, but we got to show up. Maybe Mama didn't know. But I'm the father. And he gave the command to me. So we got to show up. It's a steep climb up that mountain, but we got to show up. It's hard, Isaac. It's emotional. You're the promise I waited 25 years for. It's not easy, but we got to show up. If we would just show up, he'll do the rest. God is not interested so much in what you are, but as he is in what you are becoming. He told Abraham who he would become. The Bible says, for as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become sons of God. God doesn't want us to perish, neither does he want what he created us for to perish. God's love provided the lamb. And I love the Apostle John. I'm I'm wrapping it up. I love the Apostle John. Because he talked incessantly of the love of God. John was the lone disciple at the cross. And he looked in the face of love as Jesus died on that cross. John is the one that said, God is love. John is the one that said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John called him the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. John recorded that when Lazarus died, Jesus wept. He's still the resurrection, even when the stone isn't rolled away. The deal is still on. Blessings to you. Hallelujah. How many of you got that? The deal is still on. Authority is good for you. It keeps you. And thank you for getting to the mic first and stealing my nugget. That's all right. You did it good. We thank God. If you heard this message today and you you are looking at us through one of the social medias, we invite you to 
in response to what you heard, there was a plea made that the deal is still on and, and, and God loves you and he sent his son to die for you. You can make a confession right now and give him your life. And I'm going to lead you through it and you can repeat after me. As with the people in, in this room in live worship service. Let's say it together. Father in Jesus name. I repent of sin and I give you my life. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Today I believe in a miracle that one day you died on the cross. Three days later, you were raised from the dead to the glory of God. And on that confession, and with this faith, I am saved. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. If you made that confession, find a good church. Get into it. We're right at Military and Horatio uh, at 4660 Military. Come on out, see us at 11 o'clock. We're in live worship service. It's good for us to come together and congregate together. The Bible says that to us. I think iron sharp as iron. And when you come together in a worship, it's something about where two or three are gathered together in his name. He's in the midst. We thank you for your viewership. But we invite you into the house. Come into the house. We thank you for coming into the kingdom today. For giving your life to the Lord. Get settled in a good place that teaches plainly, straightly, offers food for you on a daily, weekly basis. That you won't get the substitute of just one meal only. God provides for you daily bread. You can have it daily. In Jesus' name. If you were in this room today, while we were saying that confession, you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just slip up a hand. That was you. You gave your life to the Lord while we were making that confession. You said it. You want to give him your life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Lord. Let's give God a praise for the word that went forth today. Come on, you can do better than that. Thank the Lord. Now let's thank the woman of God. Amen. Dynamic, thorough word. Amen. I know it Praise the Lord. To all of our viewers, we thank God for you, and we encourage your financial support of this ministry. We are here to bless you and know that the Lord will bless your giving. You can use PayPal by going to our website, dovechurch.org forward slash giving, which will take you to our PayPal page. We appreciate your sharing this time with us today. God bless you.